Just let me uh, <coughs> quickly introduce uh, Rebecca Ryan. You'll see in your handout that Rebecca's been described as a human uh, spark plug, a spark plug which actually can uh, connect with uh, kids these days. And I, th I think if we look at the title that we've got here, Workforce Trends and Bridging the Generation Gap, I think it's that generation gap, it's understanding the, the young people that Rebecca and her team are, are very uh, adept and very attracted to doing. I think it's, it's interesting <coughs> for us here at the Institute where we are continued looking at technology and I often think is technology the gap for us? Is technology actually overtaking the way that we culturally approach education, approach uh, learning? So it's interesting uh, today to hear the human side from Rebecca, working with the young people and perhaps talking about the generation gap and how the challenges that they've got in the future can be fixed. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming Rebecca. We're going to have an exciting uh, 50 minutes. That was my box cluttering up this beautiful stage. I couldn't, couldn't take it. How are you this morning? Enough breakfast, enough carbs, <laughs> coffee, caffeine. It's really an honor uh, to be here with you. This is my second day and my third speech um, in your region. And I knew that the hospitality would be great in Southern Virginia, but I think that there's more here than just hospitality. I really do feel that there is uh, a sincere need and a sincere understanding of being able to think around the corner. This region has been battered, has been battered economically. And I can identify on some level because um, in the Rust Belt of the Midwest, we've had some of the similar ebbs and flows of the economy affect us. And I was raised by a metal bender who worked for the West Bend Company in West Bend, Wisconsin, one of those company towns, right, that was named for uh, the, the company and the company named for the city. And, um, you know, after your dad's been laid off three and four and five times, you really start to question the stability of the economy, right? The stability of, um, is this a place that I want to stay? You know, is this a place that I want to raise a family? What does this region really offer for me? So I, I feel that I have a sense of the, the questions that you have about the future. But I'm also pretty impressed that yesterday at the Virginia Museum of Natural History and this morning at the Institute, I've been able to spend time in two physical structures that have been very impressive. I was told yesterday that when I walked in here, it would be like walking into a spaceship. And it is kind of like, feels like NASA. Like, I'm sure rockets could launch out of here. Uh, I'm not sure which parking lot that would be. Um, so I've been in these amazing spaces that show that people are betting on the future. And even more than that, I've been able to spend time with people whose hearts are in this region who have true heart for this region. Yesterday after my lunch presentation, I got an email from a 23-year-old woman who said that her family um, broke their backs in this town, really made this town, helped make this town during the industrial and the manufacturing era. And as a 23-year-old, she is suffering for her community because she is worried about this community. But she said, I know that I can do some good here, right? And those are exactly the kinds of folks that we want to keep, aren't they? the people who have heart for this area, the people who believe that better days are ahead, that your best days are not behind you, but that your best days are ahead. So um, I'm here to put my dab of good into the mix and see what happens. Um, my firm for the last 15 years has been studying the next generation. How do they think about work? How do they think about the communities in which they live? So I guess you could call us futurists because we're trying to understand what the future will bring. Uh, a newspaper in London several years ago wondered, because newspapers, some of you may know this, but newspaper readership has been declining, right? Subscriptions have been declining for the last several years, and a lot of newspapers are wondering, you know, what's the future? And so 
A London newspaper hired a 15-year-old kid to make a prediction about what newspapers would be like when he was 25. And basically, the finding, as he worked with his peers, is if you want to understand how a 25-year-old is going to interpret the news or obtain the news 10 years from now, you know, 10 years from now, 25 years, look at how 15-year-olds do it today. Because their habits aren't going to change. They're not going to suddenly wake up and say, wow, I have got to get a subscription to the paper copy of the news. Like, I want to become more like my grandparents, you know? That's not going to happen. Our next generations aren't going to grow up and just be like a souped up version of today's generation, right? They have their own unique characteristics. So when we help you think around the corner, we always start with who. Who will your future generations be? And this is counterintuitive because a lot of times when you're doing workforce development plans or you're writing grants, you're being asked what you're going to do. We focus so much on what and sometimes we forget to think about who. So as we talk about these five trends this morning, we're going to be talking about who. Do you remember Linda Richmond from Saturday Night Live, Talk Amongst Yourselves? Right? Talk amongst yourselves. What I found is my audiences are always at least as smart, if not smarter, than I am. And you have many of the answers to this. So what's going to happen is I'm going to put um, a question on the board in just a second. It's going to be one question. I've decided to only give you five minutes, not eight minutes. That's a typo. You're going to have five minutes to talk about it. And then we're going to do a little bit of large group sharing. So with the people at your table, I want you to answer this question. 20 years from now, in 2032, 2032, some of you will not be alive in 2032, right? Some of you will have your current four-year-old moving back in with you, okay? It's going to happen, right? But 20 years from now, in 2032, what's, to, what's tomorrow's workforce going to look like, okay? Five minutes. Go. All right, you ready? OK, let's start on this side of the hall. What were some of the top ideas? 20 years from now, what's tomorrow's workforce going to look like? Hit me. Just shout them out. Wow. Yeah, you need to kick him out the house. Uh, the 23-year-old does not want to work now, so at 43, how big of a slug is he going to be? <laughs> I suggested kicking him out of the house. Um, 20 years from now, broadly, what's the workforce of tomorrow going to look like? More, more electronic, more gadgetly connected. What else? Flexible hours? What did you say, Chris? More at home, like more work from home. Right on. Okay, let's bring it over here because we're going this way anyway. What do you have? Tables here in the center? Transient. Like they're going to be sort of gypsy workers. Right, right, right. Exactly. You can work anywhere. So um, I might be working at the coffee shop on Main Street here, or I might be at the Daily Grind in Martinsville, but I'm going to be getting my work done because I am connected at, at all times. What else? Yep, yep. More remote virtual offices. Right on. I, I feel a theme building. Sir, in the back. Ah, so what are you preparing them to be? I see. Okay. All right. Okay. How about this side of the room over here? Yes. Working anywhere in the world. Working globally on their computers. Ms. Gunn, thank you. What? Whom, whom else? More diverse. It's going to be far more diverse. It's going to look a lot different than it does today. You bet. Any of the students up here? Any of the shining stars? 20 years from now? What do you think it's going to be like? More, yes, very entrepreneurial, you bet. That corporate gig just didn't work for me, I want to make my own way. 
did, did you see that we've got two tables of shining stars up here? Truly, yes, right on. <laughs> Truly an intergenerational summit. Any good ideas that I just passed you over 20 years from now, future workforce? Right on. No more of that uh, cravat and jacket, less formal attire. Some people, like my mom, would say, can it get less formal, really? Oh, yes. Sustainability isn't going to be like this nice thing we do on the side. It's going to drive every business decision that we make. I think there are a lot of members of the next generation who would agree with that. Yes, ma'am. You bet. Your level of skill has to be pretty high, especially if you want to be recession-proof, right? So more specialization, more highly skilled. Others? Great thoughts. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so corporations, if I'm hearing you right, it's almost like the Hollywood model that they will um, hire a producer and some characters and the grips and the lighting people as needed on a project, but there, I think what you're saying is there's no long-term employment anymore. And that kind of dovetails with what this gentleman said over here about being entrepreneurial. I mean, I can see b both visions happening simultaneously. Other thoughts about the future? 2032, yes. Hi, Katie. Right, so taking sustainability with a twist, which is being, in, yeah, being environmentally um, sensitive is just the way that business happens. Is that what you're getting at? Or? Ah, right on. So, um, yeah, e ecology, I want to talk about that a little bit later on, so I'm going to leave that for right now. It's a very powerful, powerful thought. Final idea. Yes, hit me. Right on. So um, people are going to be talking about the workforce all the time in very clear terms. Um, now, whether you, you're tuned into that or not uh, will depend on you, but the next generation workforce is using social media. They're asking for what they want at work. Um, they're, you know, their parents taught them well. They, their parents said, use your words, and you can do anything. And guess what? They are using their words, and they're telling you exactly how they would like it to be, right? So um, there you have it. Well. Here's what I want to do in our time together. I already mentioned, you know, I want to, I want to talk first about who. I think this is really important, and I see these, um, I see us not focusing on this question all the time. Um, when I was a student at Drake in Des Moines, Iowa, um, Mies van der Rohe, uh, who's now passed away, a famous architect, he built one of, the f one of the buildings on campus. It's one of the most important buildings on campus, Meredith Hall. It's a two-story black glass slate um, structure. And it's it's, it was a really important building because it was done about two or three years before M Mr. Van der Rohe died, but also it was the first time that he did something really unique with his designs where he put the eye beams that we usually hide inside of walls, he put them on the outside for everybody to see. So it's a very unique and interesting building. And I had a lot of my classes in Meredith Hall. And I was proud of this building because it's this architectural kind of masterpiece. But this building frustrated me to no end because in placing the building, and the building was like in the middle of the campus, and all the residence halls and mess halls were over here. So we had to go this way to get to Meredith. But there was a commons, a big green space commons right in the middle. And they built these like winding sidewalks around to get to Meredith Hall. Well, have you been on a college campus? Kids are always running late to their classes. They're running from their dorms where they overslept or from where they just had lunch. And so everybody would just cut across Helmet Commons. I did it myself. We would just, you know, like we were voles. We would just cut these dirt pads over to Meredith, right? And it just, it made me nuts because I knew we were destroying the grass. But by the same token, I thought, why didn't they just build the sidewalk where the students were actually going to walk? I thought, you know, here's this genius architect, you know. If he would have just 
gotten a lawn chair, not very expensive, just gotten a lawn chair and sat it down, like right in the commons, and just looked at how students use the spaces around the site for his future building, he would have made sure that the landscaping made sense for how students were going to access the building. And every spring, gall darn it, those poor landscapers would be out there on Helmet Commons trying to replant the grass, watering it, getting it to go, putting the ropes up, saying, don't walk here, so then we just burn a path right next to it. You know how this goes. You see it happen all the time, right? Well, Mr. Vanderoe made this mistake, in my opinion, and I have a lot of respect for him, but I think a lot of us in building the what we forget about the who, right? Who is this building for, and how are they going to use it? So I want to focus us first on who. When we think about the future, whom are we building for? Then we can think about what, and I did leave some time for Q&A. So <coughs> buckle up. If you're going to take notes, this is the time to open up, I think, the last page of your little handout. It's got space for you to take some notes. Um, I will not be offended if you do not take notes. Um, <laughs> So, first trend, who? First trend, in America, 30 is the new 20. And I want to thank the boomers because 60 is the new 45. <laughs> Adulthood is being pushed back. 28 is the average age of a marriage for a young man in this country, 26 for a young woman. As I mentioned last night to my young professionals I got to hang out with, I said, and, and I know that many of those are starter marriages. Uh, <laughs> starter marriages. Now, this is really important for employers because we talk about this region as being a great place to what? Raise a family. If I have heard it once or read it in comments once, if I had a nickel for every comment I've read on one of your surveys, and I have reviewed approximately 1,400 pages of documents, thanks to Ms. Katie Croft and her ability to clog up my email inbox with so many attachments. I'll tell you what, I said this yesterday. If everybody cared about this region as much as Ms. Katie, we would be in, a, we would be in such a great place. Um, but, you know, if I, I read this all the time. It's a great place for families. It's not so great if you're young and single. You know, it's hard to meet people here. Well, this is really going to be a challenge for y'all moving forward because the next generation is staying young and single a lot longer. You know, they're staying single a lot longer. So it's not like a generation ago where, you know, you were engaged to be married at a very early age, in your early 20s. Now that's being pushed back. And I think to illustrate this, I just want to share uh, my friend Daryl Fulmer. Her father was an activist in the civil rights movement. Her sisters were on the cover of Life magazine uh, during the desegregation of the schools. And uh, I love this woman. And she has been a mentor and a friend to me. And occasionally we get together and we riff about generations because she's the dean of a college. So she's got a lot of generational moments that happen. But um, you know, she'll bring me in and say, Rebecca, what are you learning? And I'll, I was telling her about this move towards adulthood being pushed back. She goes, oh man, I got to tell you a story. She said, I had all three of my kids home last holiday, last Christmas. And she's got a 30-something and two 20-somethings, a boy and two girls, all accomplished. But she said, you know, my husband and I are still writing each one of them a check every month, right? And I said, oh, Daryl, don't feel bad. Because the research shows 60% of all kids in their 20s get some sort of assistance from their parents. Right? Now, I'm going to, you think about this. Did that just make the hackles go up on the back of your neck? Because if it did, you have got some generational righteousness going on. You know, you're thinking, slackers, when I was their age with your bumpity bump, right? right? Here's the thing. It's a lot different being 20 today than it was a generation ago. A lot different. The cost of college alone is 48 times, 48 percent more expensive than it was a generation ago. And I'm, I'm talking, I'm an economist, I'm talking about adjusted dollars here. 48 percent more expensive. Uh, a Harvard economist looked at the debt burden for 20-somethings leaving college today, and she said, our next generation is not even starting at the start line of their careers. Because of college debt, they are starting 50 yards behind the start line of their careers. And add to that the fact that a lot of them are unemployed. The millennial generation, those folks born between 
1982 uh, and 2001. They are the most unemployed generation in America right now. And we have a next generation that is not going to have as high a living standards as their parents did. It's the first time that's going to happen in many, many generations. Now, coming back to Daryl. So she's at church. She's, she and her husband are like anchoring the pew, you know. And she's got her three kids and their significant others. I think she's got a couple grandkids in there. And the preacher was talking about Moses and Jesus. And he uh, said, bless you. God bless you. He, he maybe said that too. I'm sure the preacher did say God bless you at some point <laughs> during his remarks. Um, he pounded the lectern and he said, Moses left home at 40. And Jesus left home at 30. And at that moment, Daryl looked down her pew, and she said, we are going for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but this really gets at this notion that adulthood, all those typical milestones of adulthood, aren't being passed in the, in the same time that they had been. Now, uh, the New York Times wrote a great cover piece on this in 2010, and they talked about the five milestones of adulthood. And just as a little bit of a quiz today, what are the five milestones of adulthood? What are the thresholds that per a person passes over to get the adult label? G give me one. Turn 21. That one's not on the list. Uh, <laughs> did I hear somebody say marriage? Yep, now you're on the right track. Come over here. Becoming in, so getting a job, let's say, right? What else? College, getting getting done with college. What did you say? Yep, yeah, being able to pay their own bills, financial independence, getting a job. Two kids, yes. Yeah, getting a house, right? A place to live. So here they are, as you mentioned. Moving out of the house, finishing school, getting a job, getting married, starting a family. We know that the next generation is not moving out. Can I get an amen? Right? Clearly front row, we've got one right here, right? Finishing school. With the job market being what it is, many young people are just choosing to stay in school, get an extra degree. It's like a safe place. They know they're taking on debt. My half-sister right now, she's like... I know I'm going to be even more in debt, but the job market is horrendous, so she's just bi you know, biding her time. Getting a job, we already talked about the unemployment rate. Getting married, I mentioned that that's getting pushed back, and starting a family. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that the next generation is having pets way earlier than they're having kids. Some of you have grand dogs, you know? And you're putting the pressure on your kids to like settle down and have a family. And I just want to tell you, settle down, snowball. It is not going to happen as quickly as you'd like it to, right? It's a, it's a different thing now. And what I want to encourage you is that this isn't better or worse, right? Because sometimes we get all generationally righteous about this and we think, well, they just don't have their act together. They just this or they just that. Just stop judging, right? We are going to do so much better if we just look at some of these trends and we say, all right, if this is the trend, how can I align to that, right? Danville's already done this. Danville started a young professionals network because they realized, they had a few young professionals came to Lori and said, how are we going to meet other single young people? And instead of Lori being like, well, find your own way or do this or do that, Lori's like, okay, let's start a young professionals network. Let's create a place where you can be with people who aren't married and don't have kids because if we don't create that in our communities, young single people are going to feel like they have to leave in order to find their own community, you know, to find community for them. So first trend is that adulthood is being pushed back. Second trend, it's actually two clumped into one, the graying and browning of America. The 2010 census revealed some amazing statistics. 83% of the United States population growth between 2000 and 2010 came from non-white populations. Non-white populations. We are on our way to becoming, I hate this term, but they're using it frequently, a minority-majority country. Right. Now, if you were paying attention at all, you saw some of these trends in the last presidential election. Because when you looked at the supporters of the McCain campaign, they tended to look like my mom, older and whiter, 
I mean, look at all those bald heads in that picture, right? They were older and whiter. This is the graying of America. Our older Americans are one of our fastest growing populations. In Europe right now, one in four Europeans are over the age of 65, right? In America, this is our fastest growing cohort. I looked at the statistics for your state, and for your state, the 65 plus age cohort is growing faster than any other cohort. Part of it is because we're living longer, right? But part of it is because we're losing talent, right? And then the Obama um, supporters tended to obviously use electronic cameras, um, but they tended to be younger and browner, less white, right? So we've got these two demographic tailwinds affecting our state and affecting our country. And I believe that what we're heading towards is not a generational gap between younger and older. What we're heading towards is a cultural generation gap. A cultural generation gap. William Fry at the Brookings Institution is the guy who I heard that expression from and nails it. A cultural generation gap. And when I think about, for example, teachers, right? Teachers and school districts in communities that are getting older, right? How are you gonna get an older population, a lot of whom are white, to vote for a younger population, a lot of whom are not white, right? We in this country have got to be able to come together to do for our next generation as well as our forebears did for us. But we're seeing these conversations happening in community after community. Sometimes it's under the banner of immigration because a lot of people make the false assumption that non-whites equals immigrants, right? So they want to slap that tag on and, you know, be able to talk about what we need to do about this situation. But for America to leave a legacy for our kids and their kids, we have to understand that these two demographic trends are in play. And we can embrace them or we can ignore them at our own peril. Bruce Katz again. This is significant. Those of us alive during this time, this is going to be one of the most significant things that we experience in our lifetime the graying and browning of our country. Third trend. Do you know the difference between a twit and a tweet? Right? <laughs> I, uh, I actually, this trend is, has been surprising to me. We've been watching this trend for quite a while, and I remember when I, got my, when I set up my Facebook account, and um, how many of you have Facebook accounts? Okay, all right. Do you remember when it asked you what high school you graduated from? And do you remember that you felt like you may be walking into a lion's den saying exactly, because you were like, oh Lord, I tried my whole life to get away from these people, and now I'm putting it out there, right? It's been really interesting because I think when, when Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and for crying out loud, even the World Wide Web, you know, your first website, when you put that out there, I think we all thought, like, this is going to expand our world so much. And to some degree it has, but I want you to think about your own technology use, your own use of social media. Some of you were on Facebook this morning before you got here today, right? And many of you were doing very local things with Facebook, catching up with people who maybe you were going to see here today. Did anybody come in today and be like, I saw your Facebook post last night. What's up? Anybody? Anybody? No? Okay. This happens a lot though, right? We think that social media is going to make our world really big, but the power of social media is in how it has helped us to localize. So this notion for the next generation is that life is going to be lived online and offline, but online life is as relevant and real, right? Facebook friends are as relevant and real as the friends that previous generations would have described as their neighbors or people that they see at church. Now, to tell the story of the power of local media, I brought a few examples along local social media. Anybody know which country this is? Kenya. Kenya. Right? Okay, so a lot of us think of Kenya and we think of going on safari, right? Elephants and the desert, right? Beautiful. 
When I think of Kenya, I think of this woman, Ori Okala, a Kenyan native who came to the United States and got her education, wrapped up with a law degree at Harvard, and like many people from Kenya, went back because she has family who are relying on her. She has to make sure that her younger siblings get an education. She's got to help support her family. And when she went back to Kenya, she was outraged because there were millions and millions of dollars coming into Kenya to help with health problems and the AIDS epidemic. And though there was no traceable way to find out if that money was making any difference at all. So the power of social media for $12. She got herself a Tumblr account. Tumblr is just a blogging platform, right? She set up a blog. I'm not sure how you say that, but let's say it's Zalendo. She set up this blog to keep an eye on the Kenyan parliament. And she started doing citizen journalism. She started asking, where's the money coming in? Where's the money going? At the time, the parliament was like the biggest old boys network you have ever seen. Closed door meetings, they didn't have any accountability. They lived in a stratosphere all by themselves. And Ori blogged about this day after day after day. She, with a $12 blog and a heck of a lot of shoe leather and many words, was able to get the Kenyan parliament to open up. This, on the right, is a lot, it's not live right now because I took a screenshot of the website, but when the Kenyan parliament is in session, there is a webcam streaming real time. So every single person who can log on can see what's going on in parliament. So one young person and a blog was able to change the political dynamic within that country from closed to open, right? From insular to inclusive. So what social media did for her is it allowed her to affect intense local change. Here's some examples of how this can work in your community, right? So a few years ago, Fast Company Magazine did an article about how young techies who know how to write code were trying to invent things that would help their cities run better. And this is one of my favorites, right? See Click Fix. This guy, um, this young kid, was so sick of seeing like graffiti or just yuck in his community, but he realized that on smartphones, it's got that GPS setting, right? So you could take a picture of where the yuck was, it would instantly tag it with the latitude and longitude, the exact coordinates of where the yuck was, and then he set up a platform where you could instantly text it to City Hall. So that City Hall could see when there was a giant pothole, or when some of the sidewalk had fallen into the road, or if there was a broken window. And now, communities around the country are using this, and it's free. I looked it up for Dansville and Mar Martin. I looked it up for Danville and Martinsville. And while there are some citizens who are posting stuff, the city is not yet using C Click Fix to respond to this. So it's an opportunity. But here's a great example from one of our clients, Farmington Hills, Michigan, right? Traffic light is out. See that? This is posted a couple months ago. And you can see. The Road Commission is responding to this. Thanks very much, we're on it. Now, the magic of this is that if you can mobilize your citizens to make the community a little bit better, you have just quadrupled your horsepower as a community. And it allows people who provide city services to be so much more adept at this. Companies are way ahead. Companies, those of you who own companies and use social media, you know that Twitter and some of these apps have, can be transformative for you because if somebody complains about what you're doing, you have an opportunity right there to help them. I was at uh, South by Southwest, which is a, you know, a conference in Austin, and I sat next to two young dudes who were, they looked like they were 14, and I said, uh, you know, what do you guys do when we're networking? And they work for State Farm, right? Sing the jingle, like a good neighbor. Right on. And so you know these, I'm sorry, I'm not a good singing voice, um, but you know that their new ads are if you sing the jingle, somebody pops up. So how were they using social media? Well, they were just monitoring, and any time somebody talked about State Farm, they had a small team of folks who would tweet back or text back or, you know, get kind of in the, in the, um, in the conversation, and I said, you know, I said, how does that work? And they said, people love it. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about it. And they said, a couple weeks ago, a guy said, hey, State Farm, I really wish I had a sandwich right now. 
And they hooked him up. They like called the local subway and said, can you deliver a gift certificate? And this guy gave them all kinds of, you know, like, holy cow, State Farm really delivered a sandwich. So then, so then I asked the obvious question. I said, well, aren't you worried that like now everyone's going to be like, hey, State Farm, you know, I need a new house. And, uh, you know, and they said, not at all, you know, because th the public knows, you know, the public has a sensibility about it. But these are just small ways that we can demonstrate this. So as you think about your workplace, you know, as you think about this community, you have citizens, workers, the public who want to help, right? So are we open to this or are we close to this? Because I'll tell you, I live in a city, Madison, Wisconsin, where one of my geeky friends designed an app so that if, like, I ride the 29 bus to and from work. And he designed this app where I can see where the 29 bus is at all times. And, which is great, but I have to use his app to do it. And if I can't catch the 29, then I have to toggle back to the city's website to figure out what other routing I should take. And so I said to the city, like, can we just adopt this dude's app because it's already such a great fit? And they're like, no, no, no. We didn't design it. We don't know if it's safe. We don't bop, 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 bop. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It's a freaking bus app. You know, he's not trying to blow up the capital, you know? So these... These next generation citizens who have huge hearts for America, here's the thing. Our next generation knows that America is in trouble. They know our cities are in trouble, right? They know that it's possible that companies could go away, which is why they're trying to be so entrepreneurial. They know that they may have to rely on themselves for job security, right, for all manner of things. They want to help. It's part of being young. They haven't yet been worn down by institutions. Right? who have told them, no, 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 they want to help. So the question is, do we invite them to the table? And as I said at lunch yesterday, when I say invite them to the table, I'm not saying that you need to leave the table. All I'm saying is you should just scooch your chairs over a little bit and ask them to pull up a chair. That's all. That's all. Another example, this one is really powerful to me. Amy Cortez wrote this book, Locovesting because she found that small businesses like ours across the country are having a really hard time getting capital from banks because the lending regulations have tightened up so much. So there is a movement afoot. I'm part of this movement because I love it. I love entrepreneurs. I am an entrepreneur, and I love doing the run around Wall Street. There is a movement afoot to not go to banks for money, but to do it the old-fashioned way, to go to your neighbors, right? The, a big platform you guys might be familiar with is this platform called Kickstarter where if you want to launch a product or expand a product line, um, the person that want, the company that wants to do this puts out a campaign. These campaigns generally run for 30 days, and they say, hey, if you support me at this level, I'll give you this. If you support me at this level, I'll give you this. Yum Tum Delivers is a two women in my neighborhood who had babies at the same time and were totally distraught that there wasn't more organic baby food. There's a lot of processed food in traditional baby food. So I'm not kidding you, these two are amazing. They got their two 12-cup Cuisinarts together. You know those like power blenders, ladies, you know what I'm talking about. They got their two 12-cup Cuisinarts together and they started to improvise what kind of organic baby food they could make. And they now have a whole line of frozen and packaged organic baby food that I will tell you, I buy it myself. Like, some of their breadsticks are incredible. Um, even though I have teeth, I find them enjoyable. Um, <laughs> and what, what they needed was 86 backers. They needed five, this is, this is so beautiful. They needed $5,000, but no bank was going to give them $5,000 because they didn't have any collateral. They don't own their homes, you know. No bank was going to even give them $5,000. So they asked their friends and family, you know why they needed $5,000? Because they were burning out their Cuisinart mixers. They just wanted a bigger mixer. These are the small ways that small businesses scale. And I looked at the statistics in this region. Total number of jobs created from 2006 to 2009 from other people bringing jobs here, 0.2% of the total number of jobs created. You know where most of the jobs are being created in this community? Stage one companies, zero to eight employees, one to eight employees, and stage two companies with nine to 99 employees. That's where most of the jobs are being created. And with innovative 
local investing tools like Kickstarter or local investing groups, you have a way to do direct investing. I'm very excited. Talk to your senators about this. Congress is about to pass, I think they're calling it the jobs bill, I'm not sure, but basically it's going to make it legal in every state to crowdfund local opportunities like this. And here's the magic of this. I happen to run one of these networks in Madison. I run a network of local people who want to invest in local business. They're burned out on Wall Street. They're sick of sending their 401k money away every month, hoping you know, that Wall Street's going to make it get bigger. And um, they want to invest in local businesses. And you know what my investors say? My investors say, number one, I already buy products from these companies. Number two, I go to church with these people. They are not going to default on the money that I am giving them. And the third thing they're saying, and this was a surprise to me, they said they're actually getting a better rate of return. So like the, the Yum Tum Baby Food folks, they got another $5,000 investment from another one of our local investors. And she wrote up the terms for a 3% payback. 3%. The girls who own the company were thrilled because 3% is totally affordable. And Barbara, the investor, was thrilled because it's more than she's making in CDs right now. You know, it's certainly more than she's making in her savings account right now. So she's like, it's, a sm it's also a good investment, you know? So you're going to start to see more and more of local folks helping take care of themselves. Fourth trend, the talent dividend. As you know, wealth has shifted. Wealth has shifted. For every 1% increase in the percentage of college grads that you can retain and attract and develop in this community, there is a $763 per capita economic bump. Now that sounds like econ speak, right? So I did some number crunching for you. Um, I'm going to just skip this. Well, I can't skip this slide quickly. What we now know is that 58% of a city's success 58%, more than half of a city's success is directly related to its ability to hang on to educated, talented people. 58%. This is, I, I describe this sometimes to my clients as like a slot machine that you know is going to pay you more than half of the time. Who would not want to stick quarter after quarter into that if you're like, every two times, I'm going to hit the jackpot? A $763 per person jackpot. So for example, in, Dan's, in Danville, I looked at this, right? You're currently at the 2010 survey said that you've got 16.1% of your population has um, got BA degrees or higher, right? If we could get that up just 4%, just 4%, that's not a ton of people. Right? It's like a few thousand more people with degrees. That would be a $1.3 million economic impact. You think about what that means for the community. What can $1.3 million buy you in this community? Who's got a project right now that they want to do that $1.3 million could like, bam, get it done? Anybody? I see a couple of hands going up, right? So now let's look at Martinsville. Martinsville, it says that you've got 19.9% of your folks with college degrees. What if we could get that to 25%? Now, Martinsville's a smaller community, half million dollar economic impact. Right? Take any, these aren't big numbers. You know, we're not saying double your population of folks with bachelor degrees. We're saying 1% by 1% by 1%, right? So what does that mean for you? It means that the college educated folks that you have here, we need to work mightily to keep them here, right? And some of that is about doing exactly what Lori's doing with the Young Professionals Network, connecting them to each other so that they feel that they have a social fabric. People often stay or leave communities because of their emotional connections. The best thing that could happen for single young professionals in Danville is if they marry somebody from here, right? Because then they are never gonna leave, right? Because their mamas won't let them, right? <laughs> So we need to do everything we can to retain them. But the other thing that we need to do, and this is why I'm so excited about the workforce plan, think about whatever your current level of education is, right? Maybe you have your GED, maybe you don't, right? Maybe you have almost your two-year degree, maybe you're just a few credits shy of your bachelor's degree, right? What if we could just get a few more folks over the end line? 
In this community, I want you to just think to yourself, how many folks do you know who are a few credits shy of that next degree? They've almost gotten their associate's degree, but they backed out. They're almost at their bachelor's degree, but they backed out. Oh, they dropped out of their master's program. If we could push just a few more of them over the line, right, what an impact that would have in our community. Fifth trend. Where I live matters. It's the only way that you can explain how people with good jobs in this community will leave. But many of you have told me stories of this happening. Right? They leave because you don't have the cultural amenities of a bigger city or you don't have the, you know, the social fabric. So for employers, what this means is it's not just about having a good job, offering a good job. You also have to sell this community. You've got to be able to talk about things that matter to them. Right? And you know who's great at that? The real estate community. The real estate community wants to sell you a house, but they know that in order to sell you a house, they have to sell you on the community. Right? So maybe we need to work more closely together with our real estate community to really shine the light on what's going on. Maybe we have to send everybody who works in human resources like we did in Nashville, we need to put them through cool school and actually show them the loft departments and talk with them about the downtown developments and make sure that they actually have a coffee in Uptown in Martinsville so that they know the assets and amenities that they can talk to the next generation about, the things that are already here. It's not enough to sell the job. So a few ideas on quality of life, right? Quality of life is so important to retaining this workforce. We know that there are seven indexes that the next generation looks at when they think about your community. And I'm going to rattle them off here. The first one, you guys have in spades, right? Unless you're completely underpaying people, folks can afford to live here, right? I talked to some people who've moved from Washington, D.C., and New York, and other places, and they say, wow, you know, you can save money here, right? Even sometimes if the pay is not great, you can still save money here. That's terrific. Yesterday I went out for lunch, a late lunch, and the lunch special was $3.75. And I can't get lunch for under $10 at home, right? So I ordered it, and I had to have a doggy bag, you know? So, so the, the, you know, the, and I left an enormous tip. Um, but the, the thing here is, you know, this is enough to get people interested, especially now with the recession being what it is, but it's not enough. Same thing with jobs. You know, sometimes people say to me, well, Rebecca, it's all about a job. Sort of. Jobs are important, but they're not sufficient, right? Because the next generation, especially those who've got skills or ambition, they believe that they can live and work anywhere. So jobs are one of the seven indexes but even the next generation, when you ask them, of these seven indexes, which matters most? Cost of lifestyle is currently the one that matters the most. Right? Being able to get a job is second. Right? Third thing, vitality. How healthy is this community? So when we measure a community, we look at things like your parks and your, you know, your rails to trails that you guys have been working on. Good. That's moving in the right direction. We look at things like farmers markets. We look at things like food deserts. A food desert, if you haven't heard, and there's a lot of grant money available right now to address this issue, but a food desert is a place where citizens can, are not within a one mile, um, with, they're not within one mile of a green grocer, a place where they can actually get vegetables. And you know, these food deserts tend to be in our most impoverished areas. And it's a crime. <laughs> it's a crime that people can't get access to fresh fruits and vegetables because of where they live. So um, we look at food deserts and obesity rates and things like that. The next index, does this community value learning? My heart nearly broke last night. Um, well, that's probably an overstatement, but I was shocked to hear this last night. Last night when I was spending time with the young professionals, we were in a group similar to this, and I said, um, I asked them to talk with each other about the one stereotype, the one thing that other generations don't get about their generation. 
And one young woman said, the older generation doesn't understand why I would want to get an education and have a job. Right? Man, that's something. If you have family pressure or social pressure to not achieve, right, we got to move the dial on this. We know that prosperity is moving to the regions that have educated and engaged talent. Ireland did an amazing thing. You know, Ireland for years had been the butt of every joke about dumb, drunk Irish people, right? And their economy was in a shambles. Their education rate was horrendous. So labor and educators and business and community leaders got together and they set this goal. They said, what if we just got everybody that next level of education? So if you have a high school degree, we're going to do everything we can to make sure you get an associate's, an associate's, a bachelor's, and so on. Very similar to this workforce plan. And I want you to just understand that it only took one generation for that effort to take root. One generation. It was a very simple plan. Everybody just gets the next level of education. We're going to line up behind this, all of us. That means that businesses gave their employees time off to pursue their next level of education. In some cases, they provided tuition reimbursement. Right? That means that education institutions had to figure out how to teach to adult learners right, who are coming back to school after not. They had to retool, but in one generation, they moved from having one of the lowest education rates in Europe to having one of the best. So good, in fact, that during the tech bubble, when Dell and Microsoft and all those tech companies wanted to expand to Europe, Limerick, Ireland was able to attract a disproportionate number of those foreign headquarters because they had such an educated group. Think in one generation, 20 years from now, by 2032, could Southern Virginia become the place where if a Chinese company wants to expand, they come here because of the levels of education, right, and the network to the rest of the country. An amazing, bodacious goal but definitely achievable. If Ireland can achieve it with all their beer drinking, you can achieve it here in Southern Virginia. Around town is the next um, indicator of a cool community. How easy is it to get around and out of town? We don't want people spending time in their cars, right? And here's why. I shared this statistic at lunch yesterday. For every 10 minutes that you spend in your car commuting to work, for every 10 minutes, so think about how long your commute is. For every 10 minutes spent in traffic, commuting to work, your civic participation goes down 10%. Right? So sometimes you hear you know, people say, I don't even know the names of my neighbors, or I don't have time to bake cookies for the bake sale, that's why I have to pick them up at the, you know, in a package, and then I buy a plate and put them on a plate so it looks a little bit less prepackaged, right? Or, I didn't, get to, I didn't have time to vote in the last election, or I can't volunteer at my church. Some of that is because we're spending so darn much time in our cars. So as we think about, as you as business owners think about maybe expanding your business or relocating your business somewhere in the region, I want you to, the first thing I'm going to challenge you to do is look at the zip codes of where your employees live. Because if you can make their commutes easier, the social fabric of your community will strengthen because they will have more time to do things outside of work. Social capital. Is this a community where the usual suspects run everything? Or is this a community that embraces everyone? In my last book, I wrote about um, a tragic plane crash. I think it was in 1974, some of you might remember this. In 1974, a bunch of arts patrons from Atlanta chartered a plane to listen to the Atlanta Symphony play in Paris. So they went on this private chartered plane. These were judges and mayors and, you know, the elite of Atlanta. They chartered this plane so that they could listen to their symphony play in Paris. And on the way back, the plane crashed. The plane crashed. And this was a tragedy for Atlanta. Every one of the significant leaders of that community died in this plane crash. But it really is an interesting thing to think about because Atlanta has emerged as a capital, right? And I wonder, I wonder if Mayor Shirley 
Atlanta's beloved mayor, would have become the mayor if that plane hadn't crashed. Right? I wonder if the social change and Atlanta's new reputation as a multicultural metropolis would be different if that plane hadn't crashed. Right? I'm not here to stand in judgment, but it's interesting to think about, right? Is the social fabric of this region strengthened by our current leadership, or is it thwarted? Right? And if you feel that it's thwarted, then we just have to find ways of moving around that, right? Because progress always swings in the direction of more inclusion for more people. And we are facing these demographic headwinds that are gonna require it. The last index, this is a fun one, what's there to do after hours? And you're doing such a great job in the region with your cultural events, you're trying to do more programming. This is really important, right? People wanna have stuff to do after five. They wanna be able to kick at their heels. Right now, Greensboro is taking all your money. You know, in the surveys that I've looked at, young people are going to Greensboro at least once a month, sometimes more, right? Well, good for Greensboro, but like, we gotta get over that. Let's keep some of that money here on the evenings and on the weekends. And some of you are saying, well, nothing's open on the evenings. Here is an act of insurrection, right? Here's what I would recommend. Young professionals get together, buy the largest fluorescent post-it notes you can with big fat markers, right? And those stores that you would like to visit after work when it's most convenient for you to actually visit stores because it's not convenient during work hours. It always kills me that bankers hours are between eight and five. That's convenient for the banker. Um, we did this in a community in Kansas. That next generation said, nothing's open after five. So we took these post-it notes, we took these big markers and they went and they said, you know, I wanted to buy, at the, elect, at the appliance store, I was looking for a washer, I had $400 to spend, sorry you weren't open. Boy, in one night, when you see post-it notes that add up in the thousands of dollars, it sends a message in your community, right? So you want more to do? Talk about it. Send a message, a loud, a visual message. And this is how we plot this out. So this is actually the handprint in all seven indexes, the scores in all seven indexes of Austin, Texas. You can see why Austin attracts so many young people. They are doing pretty well. My time is short. I need to get moving on, but I want to share that, you know, I've been talking about this stuff for 15 years, but I have never felt like it's been more important than now. Because America goes through seasons. Our springtime was after World War II, when in the span of just 12 years, incomes in this country doubled. The American economy was a rocket ship, and some of you rode it, or your families rode it, and it was a time of amazing prosperity. Everything felt possible. Summer came with the Watts riots, when the baby boomer youth generation started asking real questions about what this country really stood for. And their answer was civil rights, women's rights, environmental rights. Three huge social movements started when winter, when, excuse me, when summer came to America in 1965. Fall came to America around 1981. It was during this time that many of our institutions, as fall does, starts to show signs of decay and loss, right? The nuclear family exploded, divorce rates skyrocketed, our education institutions were no longer producing the smartest scientists and the smartest mathematicians. We started getting eclipsed by other countries, right? We started to look at politics and other institutions and wondering, do these institutions even work anymore? Fall. In 2001, two planes crashed into the Twin Towers and winter came to America. By 2002, our longest running bull market in this country ended. Wall Street started freaking out about how they were going to make more money, more wealth for this country. So they invented CDOs and leveraged and over leveraged their assets. And by 2008, all Americans were feeling the winter once again. Winter comes to America every 80 to 100 years. Our last one was the Great Depression. And at that time, when Franklin, when President Roosevelt, excuse me, accepted the um, Democratic Party's um, nomination. He said in his famous rendezvous with destiny speech, he gave a nod to the seasonality of our country. He said, to some generations much is given and from some much is expected. Those of us breathing air at this moment, much is expected of us. Spring will come again. 
to America. It always has. We've been through this cycle three other times. Spring will come again, but the kinds of questions we ask and the kinds of investments we make at this moment will determine whether Southern Virginia becomes a place that works better for more people or if it doesn't. And now I want you to think into deep time. If you have a child, I want you to think about the last living relative that you might meet. It might be a grandchild or a great-grandchild, right? Think about where you are. If you are a young person in your 20s, I want you to think about um, how far into the future you're going to know somebody. So it might be a niece or a nephew or their, their kid, your great-niece or great-nephew, right? Yesterday, a baby boomer was able to go into deep time, and she knew, and this is a person who I think is retired or retiring, she was able to go into deep time. She said the last relative that she will probably actually meet will be born in 2035, 2035, right? By 2035, spring will be here again. But the choices that she makes will impact whether that great-grandchild will inherit a better Southern Virginia or not. So. With that, we have important work to do. The calls to action today are to move your chair over a little to the side. If you're a member of our current generation of leaders, just make room at the table and listen fully without attachment. Our next generation knows that they're going to inherit the decisions that we make during this moment. And if you're a member of the next generation, if you're a member of the next generation, I want you to remember this. Your elders put a man on the moon Right? They put a man on the moon, and the average age of the team that did that was only 28 years old. So if anybody ever tries to tell you that you don't have enough experience, right, or you don't have enough credibility, or maybe you just are too young to have good ideas, it was their generation in their 20s that broke new frontiers. You are that next generation. Stand in your voice. Stand with courage. The world needs you. Thank you.